Okay. So in the in this paper of yours, you talk about how it's unusual to discover mm -hmm. new coded genes yeah. evolving from non-coded mm -hmm. DNA. Um, what did you mean by that? Well, if you think about a gene, um, it's actually quite a complicated thing. You've got this promoter regulatory sequences at the beginning. If it contains introns, those have to be spliced out correctly, and there are kind of sequence signals in order that, for that to happen correctly. And if these things aren't working properly, your gene is not going to work properly. So it's a relatively complicated thing. And so the easiest way of getting a new gene, once you already have a gene, the easiest way of getting a new gene is by copying an existing gene and modifying it. Yep. And in fact, this is what we see in evolution. We see that the most common way of getting a new gene is by duplication and modification. And um, this happens slowly but continuously over time. And so it was essentially believed that... Um, you know, we couldn't get new genes from scratch anymore. It must have happened way at the origin of time, the origin of, uh, so let's say, sorry, the origin of uh, life, but... Yeah. Um, um, but then but, we've had but, four billion years yeah, to do Yeah, when, when it's so been therefore. essentially too difficult to mm -hmm. make them from scratch, that yeah. it was going to be an insignificant process. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there are plenty of people who've said, you know, that evolution doesn't create, it just tinkers. Yeah. And... Um, but so it was just a few years ago that the first ever example of this that I know about was found in um, Drosophila, where they found good evidence that a new gene was created from non-coding DNA. And so um, it's really, like if you talk about all the examples that are known about, um, there's maybe 11 genes like this in fly, and uh, one gene in in one gene in yeast, and that's all there was before our work came out. And, and so um, it was really an unusual and not a very common thing, and many people aren't even studying it because they don't expect it to And especially happen. when there's such a small amount of time and such a small amount of change between yeah. uh, primates, mm -hmm, uh, between mm -hmm. um, chimpanzees and ourselves. Yeah. That, uh, but that in a certain it. way, there's also kind of, I suppose, a, a limited window of opportunity to find these because in order to be convincing, you do want to find the non-coding DNA to compare it to, to say, look, this is the DNA the, that's, that's the related DNA in this other organism, and we can kind of show the steps. And um, when you've got non-coding DNA, it usually will evolve quite quickly. So you have a limited window of opportunity when you could identify that. So for example, let's say, I think it's, I think it's quite plausible that this has been going on all the time throughout vertebrate history, but if I compare the human genome with the chicken genome, um, I might find genes that I can't find that are in one organism that mm -hmm. I can't find in the other, but it's very hard for me to distinguish how those came about. Is it just okay. that some genes that are common but have evolved a bit too far for me to recognize them with BLAST? Or, you know, so there's this thing of the window of opportunity. Yep. So is, you talk in your paper about how the, there are these disablers mm -hmm. which cause the, the, these sequences to not be able to encode yeah. genes in... Um, in chimpanzee, yes, but uh, yes. they can in, in humans. So can you explain a bit more about what you mean yeah. by a disabler? Then? Well, the disablers in this case are going to be essentially stop codons or other kinds of mutations that cause a stop codon downstream. So if you, if you insert or delete, so an indel of any nucleotides that aren't a multiple of three, they change everything downstream. So even if it doesn't create a stop codon right there, it might create a stop codon five codons later. And so when you've got all these stop codons, you can say, well, this isn't a protein because it's got an, the, the potential protein is own, it's so short, it's, it's implausible and kind of ridiculous. And so the disablers were useful in this project for two points of view. First of all, for showing that actually this isn't um, protein coding sequence in CHIMP. And the second thing was we could use these disablers and kind of say, well, how many of these can we actually identify where we can say that there's the exact same disablement in human and uh, sorry in chimp and in macaque, mm -hmm. and the reason this is important is because we wanted to distinguish between a, um, the hypothesis where this gene is newly created in human from the alternative hypothesis where the gene is really really old, but in chimp and macaque it's, it's got disabled. Been off yeah, disabled. and so if 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 um, chimp and macaque have exactly the same. Um, sequence differences that um, disable the mm -hmm. protein, then we can say that's a single event that's really ancestral, yep. rather than having different ways okay. they're disabled. So, okay, so, so disablers are really part of the key of this. Yes, yeah, yeah. they were kind of the telltale, um, okay. telltale mutations. Okay, and so then you have these three novel genes which you've identified, so what do you think that they mm, actually I wish do? I knew. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'd love to say, of course, that there's something really important in what makes us human, and this is the reason why people get excited about it, because you know it's interesting to find things that are human-specific in case they might 
be involved in human specific traits but the truth is we really don't know at this point um, so what sort of work are you doing to try to find out well that they really exist yeah, and what so, they do well what you'd normally do as a geneticist is you'd look at that gene in your model organism yeah. but uh, these genes only exist in human and there's not some a very reason, good model organism yeah for some reason we're not allowed to experiment <laughs> I don't know I'm sure you can find somebody willing but, uh, <laughs> um, but so what we can do though is we can do experiments on cell lines so these would be like particular tissue cells uh, tissue so isolated lines. cells from yes. a, a human. Yeah, and so these are limited in scope because, of course, human is a complex multicellular organism, and some phenotypes will only be visible on this scale. You might not see something going on in a in a cell or a few a few cells, but maybe it's it's a it's a process that is kind of more. Uh, on a grand a scale, in your, and especially if it was affecting something like speech or you know, these kind of things, you're never going to notice you're not going in to a, see that some in liver cells. Cell in a yeah, yeah. So, but but we so but so it's limited in scope, but we're we're doing them anyway. And so the kind of things we're doing is like, first of all, like confirming again that we can find the protein using antibodies, and then doing experiments and um, trying to turn off the gene. So we're using RNA I RNA interference to turn off the gene. So. And we do that, and we say, okay, look, the, we can show then, okay, we could detect the protein before, now we can't detect the protein, yep. and we can say, well, are there any noticeable phenotypes? Okay. Um, the only really, the only phenotype you can really test for in cell lines is growth, so we can we can look at that, um, but it's limited in scope, but, you know, it's kind of a fingers crossed yeah, type yeah. thing. We'd love to know what they do, yeah, so we're and, trying. Uh, yeah, you can only do the experiments which are possible mm -hmm. as well. That's yeah. always part of the problem yeah. with science. And so that's why science evolves, because we have new ways of doing things yeah, as, yeah. as things go forward. Okay, and so, but some people, as you touched on before, some people have suggested these could be God genes, yeah. or <laughs> somehow the genes that make us human, for yeah, example. Yeah. Um, what do you think about that idea? Well, um, I just, I suppose I don't really like the term God genes too much. I'm not quite sure what people mean by it. Some people mean different things. Some people mean the genes for religiosity, or other people mean the genes that show there is no God because creation happens within evolution, we can create new stuff. But um, yeah, so I'm not, don't really want to go there. You know? <laughs> no, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult question because yeah. you know, you're, we're used to measuring things yeah, and yeah. observing things, uh, and so therefore that's a, a philosophical yeah, question. Yeah, I, I suppose, guess, is, in a certain way. But, um, but I mean, the idea that, I mean, uh, the reason, if we're so, I'm honest in saying we don't know what they do, but also to be honest, part of the reason people get excited is because these are new human genes. If these were new frog genes, I think there wouldn't be the same level of interest. Yep. Um, and so there is this um, excitement, you know, this hope that maybe these are some kind of clues to, to you know, some human-specific traits. And so, um, but we don't, we really don't know yet. Okay, so this yeah. is where lots of experiments yeah, yeah. have to be done. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's still, I think, um, you know, it's still interesting uh, from our point of view anyway because it is a very very, um, it really gives us an insight into a different way of how genes come about that we didn't really appreciate before. So now we're getting to appreciate that. And so in that sense, I think it's interesting as something to be aware of in terms of how even works. And especially works. In, yeah, in quite a short evolutionary yeah, space yeah, yeah. as well. Yeah. No, that's definitely okay, and so how has the project progressed since you published the paper? Because uh, obviously writing a paper takes, uh, takes time. Yeah, so. and has, um, yeah, so what we're doing now as well, so we have this first estimate of the, how much this happens, which we say it's better. We're talking about that we found these three cases in human. Because of all the problems with the data, we estimate there should be about 18. So we're mm -hmm. kind of estimating how many we couldn't see. And um, But this is the only estimate we have in any of the vertebrate lineages. We don't know yet is this uh, is, is human... Um, experience this more or less than other lineages. So we'd, what we're trying to do now is look at measure this in other lineages. So we're looking at other primate lineages. So we're looking kind of earlier in the primate history. So we're including gorilla and orangutan in these studies. But also we want to look in, in um, rat and mouse and do a comparison there yep. and see if we can get a feeling for how unusual human okay, so, is. So people could have been wrong that it's not such an unusual phenomenon. At all, this or maybe, compared to copy and pasting. The, well, I think it is much ra more rarer than that. It definitely mm -hmm. is. But in terms of, um, you know, so the the number of genes that human has is that completely expected by compared to all the other vertebrate lineages. We don't know yet because yep. we don't have any estimate from any other vertebrate okay. lineage. Yeah, okay. So. No, that's brilliant. So, well, good luck okay. with yeah, that. Thanks. Well. Uh, thank you.